the last Sabbath that I had opportunity to speak to you and give the sermon, I focused in on one, res- one particular response toward guilt. And we focused in last Sabbath that I had opportunity to speak to you and give a sermon, I focused in on one, res- one particular response toward guilt. And we focused in on the response of the scorner. And the fact that the scorner uh, really is an individual who has a, a an attitude of scorn or derision uh, toward guilt, uh, toward sin, is one that seeks to make a joke of sin, doesn't take sin seriously. Uh, We're told that, uh, in reality, that it is a fool who scorns guilt, who who has a scornful, mocking, uh, derisive attitude toward guilt. Uh, In effect, the scorner denies his guilt, through an attitude of pride, an attitude of scorn, uh, he ridicules the notion of guilt. The the idea that he himself is guilty, is a sinner. And he ridicules that idea. And that, of course, is a very destructive attitude. That is a very destructive approach because when an individual has that sort of a haughty, scornful, prideful attitude... When an individual considers himself, in effect, above the law, has an attitude of scorn toward guilt, that is a very destructive attitude because that individual, by his attitude, is cut off from God's mercy and God's forgiveness, is cut off from having his guilt removed, and is in reality locked in a situation that will bring him under the judgment of God. It is a destructive attitude, but you know, brethren, there is another attitude that is equally destructive. There is another attitude that will just, is just as destructive because it will also just as surely block us out from the only way of removing guilt. I want to focus in on that and to help us to understand a little bit about a proper response and a proper uh, approach to the subject of guilt. Let's turn in our Bibles back to Matthew chapter 27. Now, in Matthew uh, well, let's go back first to chapter 26, because here we have the story uh, of Jesus Christ prior to the Passover. And uh, in Matthew 26 verse two, it was after two. Uh, We're told that uh, this occasion is two days prior uh, to the Passover and the time when the Son of Man would be betrayed to be crucified. And and there assembled, verse 3 of Matthew 26, the chief priests 
the scribes, the elders of the people. They assembled in the palace of the high priest who's called Caiaphas. And they consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. They didn't want to do it on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people. Jesus was popular among many of the people. He had preached. He had performed miraculous healings. Uh, the people were impressed with him. The religious leadership had decided that he was an individual that had to be removed and gotten rid of. And yet they were afraid to, to just go out and uh, grab him in a public occasion. Uh, they were afraid there would be an uproar, uh, uh, perhaps a riot. Uh, they did not want that. But they wanted to take him subtly. The problem was, however, the only time when they really knew where he was, uh, there was a big crowd around. It, he would, uh, uh, you know, they'd look around and here he was there in the temple or on some occasion and there'd be a big crowd. And what they wanted was to get him off away from the crowd, to be able to do what they wanted to do. And uh, so as we come on down a little bit later, Jesus was in Bethany, which was near Jerusalem, in the house of Simon the leper. And there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment. She poured it on his head as he sat there. And when the disciples, when his disciples saw it, they had indignation. They said, what purpose is this waste? Now this precious ointment, you're looking at something that, uh, th this is like, uh, well, you could compare it to a bottle of of uh, very expensive perfume. Uh, maybe the most expensive, uh, you know, if you were to go to an exclusive department store and buy, buy very expensive perfume uh, that would, uh, uh, you, you don't pour something like that out. You, you just use just a little drop, just a little dab. And uh, this was actually comparatively uh, far more expensive than that because this was the equivalent uh, of... Uh, uh, you know, a goodly portion of a year's wage. Uh, this was, uh, you, you know, would be in our, uh, in our currency of perhaps, uh, uh, you know, two or three thousand uh, dollars in this little bottle. It would have been very, uh, very expensive. And uh, she came in with this as he sat there and she poured it on him. She didn't just a little drop. Uh, she poured it there, this, this little small vial, uh, poured it there on his head. And the disciples were indignant. Why? They said, what's the purpose of this waste? Why this ointment? This is expensive. Why? This is thousands of dollars. This could have been sold for much and given to the poor. And Jesus understood. He said, why, why are you troubling this woman? She has wrought a good work upon me. You have the poor always with you, but you don't have me always. And she has poured this ointment on my body. She did it for my burial. Well, they didn't understand exactly what that meant. But uh, he said, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, uh, there also this that this woman has done shall be told for a memorial of her. So here was a woman that desiring to, to express her complete devotion, the most valuable, the most expensive thing that she had, uh, she brought and, and, and completely sacrificed, completely gave to Jesus Christ. She was uh, overwhelmed with uh, a sense of his presence and who he was and her desire to express to him uh, that loyalty and that commitment and that devotion. Well, the disciples were told, they, they, they were bothered by this. They didn't like it. They didn't understand. And one in particular was the source of it. He was the one who stirred it up. You see, then we're told that one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went out to the priest. Went out to the chief priest. Now, when the, the result, if we want to, to get, uh, let, let's go on back to John 12. I want to show you the parallel account. Let's understand why at this point Judas went out. 
Now, here was another event. This, this event that, uh, that occurred here two days prior to the Passover was, was really the, the conclusion. This was the icing on the cake. But just a matter of four days before that, uh, Jesus had been uh, eating with Lazarus and, and uh, Mary and Martha. And uh, Mary, verse 3 of John 12, had taken an, a pound of an ointment of spikenard which was very costly, and she had anointed his feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. And then said one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Judas was the one, you see, several days earlier, Mary had, had made this great elaborate display, and Judas had been indignant. And said, you know, this is extravagance, this is wasteful, uh, this is terrible that, that he should allow such a thing. This should have been sold and given to the poor. Now, verse 6, John says, This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag, and he bore what was put therein. Jesus said, let her alone the day of my bearing. As she kept this, the poor you have with you always. Now, Judas obviously didn't like this rebuke, Jesus said, you know, as Jesus looked over at him. And of course, Jesus could look right through him, and he knew that Judas wasn't all that concerned for the poor. But Judas, Jesus just looked right through him, and he said, you know, the poor you have with you always... Uh, she's done this for a very important reason. She's done this in preparation for my burial, and uh, you leave her alone. Well, just a few days later, a very similar event occurs. Again, the same thing. And Judas, by this time, has become so embittered, uh, so filled with, with uh, bitterness and resentment that things weren't being done his way. And I'll tell you, you have to, sometimes you have to be careful with people who profess all sorts of motives. You know, Judas always professed that, that his motives were that he was so concerned about the poor. That's why he was against all that extravagance. And, you know, John, of course, brings to our attention that Judas really didn't give a flip about the poor. Uh, Judas was the keeper of the bag, and he was a thief. And he was out to steal the money. And uh, Judas primarily resented the fact that he couldn't get his hands on the money. That was what Judas resented. But uh, Judas, this resentment had built up. And so as we go back to Matthew uh, chapter 26 here, in verse 14, Then one of the twelve called Judas went out unto the chief priest and said, What will you give me that I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with, covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. You see, Judas being in the inner circle, being one of the twelve, Judas was in a position to know where Jesus was going to be apart from the crowds, where he would be off away from the groups and the multitudes. And he was exactly what they were looking for. This was going to solve the problem. Well, Judas did betray Jesus. Jesus was arrested and was taken to be crucified. Now, let's go forward to Matthew 27 and verse 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? You see to that. That's your problem. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple 
and departed and went and hanged himself. How did Judas respond to guilt? How did Judas respond to guilt? Well, ultimately, Judas became so depressed that he committed suicide. Judas became, became overwhelmed with a sense of his own inadequacy, with a sense of his own uh, unworthiness, with a sense of what he had done, and he committed suicide. Was that a solution? Is that the way we expiate guilt? Does that, does that solve the problem? No, you know, all that does is add one more sin. Sin of murder. Judas took an approach that has certainly been taken by others. He exemplifies that approach. An approach that is not the approach of the scorner who disdains and mocks at guilt, but one who begins to be overwhelmed with a sense of his own guilt. One who becomes overwhelmed and discouraged and depressed and despondent, weighted down with a sense of his own guilt, his own lack of any worth or value, the feeling of absolute hopelessness, What's the use? Just blot it out and get it over with. Second Corinthians chapter 7 addresses some of this and addresses a contrast. We're told in Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 10. Godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, not to be turned from. But the sorrow of the world works death. The sorrow of the world works death. You know, the other approach, there, the approach of the scorner is a destructive approach because it blocks the individual from repentance and forgiveness. But the approach of worldly sorrow is just as destructive. It brought about, in Judas's case, his destruction, his suicide. The approach of worldly sorrow. Because worldly sorrow works death. That is a destructive approach. It's not the solution to wallow in guilt, to get down at the bottom and just to be overwhelmed with a sense of our own uh, total guilt and feeling that, that there is no way that we can somehow uh, be okay. Let's, let's look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's begin in verse 1. Paul writes, Having, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having these promises. What are the promises? The promises that God will be in us. The promises that we can become a part of His very family. The promises just as it mentions in verse 18, that He'll be to us a Father and we can be His sons and daughters. Having these promises, let us therefore cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. In other words, we have to clean up. Clean up the outside and the inside. You see, they're both important. The, the filthiness of the flesh means the, the actions, the outward things we do. The things that, are, uh, that God does not approve of. Filthiness of the flesh. 
The transgression of the, the outward, direct violation of God's law. Those are things that have to be gotten rid of. We can't compromise with sin. Having these promises, let's cleanse ourselves. Let's get rid of these sins. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit. It's not enough just to refrain from the outward violation of God's law to just uh, pull back and make changes in terms of outward actions. But most importantly, we have to get down to what's on the inside to cleanse not only the flesh, but the spirit. A washing, a cleansing of the way we are on the inside, the way we think, our desires, the inner person. Perfecting holiness, and, and that term perfecting just means uh, to, to uh, bring to, to completion or to, uh, uh, to, to follow through, to finish, to complete. God imparts holiness to us through the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. Holiness is not something that we can impart to ourselves. Holiness is a characteristic of God. God cleanses us as we repent of our sins and He forgives us. He cleanses us. We go through uh, the waters of baptism as an outward symbol of that cleansing. And then following that, God places His Spirit within us to impart to us uh, that beginning, that germ of eternal life, to impart to us that, that spiritual beginning as we will grow and develop, it imparts to us His nature. He makes us a partaker of His nature. Just as a little child becomes a partaker of his parent's nature. When that little child is, you know, when a little child is conceived, whose nature does it partake of? Well, you know, we look at a little child and we say, oh, you know, he's, he's got eyes like... Uh, uh, his uh, his father or his grandfather. And, and we see characteristics that remind us of various ones in the family because he partakes of the nature of the heredity of his father and mother. We become, Peter tells us, partakers of the divine nature. God imparts his nature to us through his spirit. He imparts holiness, which is his characteristic, his indwelling. We are to, co to bring to completion that holiness in the fear of God. In other words, standing in awe of God, being in reverence of God, we are walking in the way of holiness. We're following in God's ways and we're bringing to completion, allowing God to complete in us what He has begun. Paul goes on, Receive us, we have wronged no man, we have corrupted no man, we have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorying of you. I'm filled with comfort. I'm filled, I'm exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were in Macedon, we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforted those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Oh, sure, you know, we can be surrounded by strife on the outside and filled with fears on the inside. Uh, there's nothing unique and terrible in that. Uh, Paul was. Paul was surrounded by all sorts of confusion and strife on the outside and filled with fears on the inside. But God who comforts those that are cast down. God comforts those that are cast down. Comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he, is comfort, he was comforted in you when he told us of your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more. For though I made you sorry with a letter, I do not repent. Though I did repent, 
For I perceive the same epistle has made you sorry, though it were but for a season. And I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might have damaged by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, not to be turned from. The sorrow of the world works death. You sorrow after a godly sorrow. Judas had the sorrow of the world. Judas had worldly sorrow. It was a depression, it was a discouragement, it was a frustration. It saw him overwhelmed with a sense of futility and inadequacy and and just absolute total frustration at his inability to have brought about whatever it was he thought he was going to bring about and and the, to stop the consequences that he saw, overwhelmed with a sense of guilt, and he committed suicide. Brethren, that's not the alternative God has for us. That's not the the uh, that that's not the the way to uh, to resolve the issue of guilt. In Acts chapter thirteen, the apostle Paul is preaching a sermon in Antioch, and Speaking of Jesus Christ in verse 37, he says, He whom God raised again saw no corruption. In other words, his body did not decay, but he was raised up, restored to life. Verse 38, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. And by him all that Believe or justified from all things. From that from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Be it known to you that through this man Jesus Christ is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins by him, by Christ. All that believe are justified from all things. Things that you could not be justified from by the law of Moses. You see, the attitude of the scorner and the attitude of worldly sorrow are equally destructive because they cut us off, they each cut us off from the only way out from under him. And the only way out from under is through Jesus Christ, who made possible the forgiveness of sin. Of sin. Jesus Christ made possible the forgiveness of sin when uh, let's, let's go back to, to uh, Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. 1 John 3, 4 tells us that sin is the transgression of the law. All have sinned. You have sinned. I have sinned. We've come short of the glory of God. Now, going on though, Paul writes, Being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, to be a payment, through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, is righteousness, God's righteousness, that He, God, might be just and the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. 
Where's boasting then? It's excluded. By what law? Works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that man is justified by faith without, apart from, the deeds of the law, the works of the law. Justification is through faith. Distinct from the works of the law. You know, we saw back in, in Acts 13.39 that uh, the law of Moses was not able to uh, bring justification and forgiveness in, uh, in these areas. But we can be justified by faith, not, not by the works of the law, not because you go out and, and uh, here Paul was specifically dealing with the issue of circumcision. What really gains us access to God is Jesus Christ. To the Jews and the Gentiles of the first century, when circumcision was discussed, the issue was the issue of access to God. You could not enter the inner court of the temple if you were uncircumcised. That's why they had the uh, outer court, the court of the Gentiles, but the inner court where sacrifices were made where uh, that symbolized having access to God, being able to participate fully in the worship of God, was only open to those who had been circumcised, which was the sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham. The issue was an issue of access to God. What does it take? What is necessary to be able to come into the presence of God? This was, uh, this was a major issue. Uh, you remember in the book of Acts that there was a riot that was stirred up because Paul was accused of bringing uncircumcised Greeks into the temple, into the area of the temple that was forbidden to. Well, Paul hadn't done that. But he is bringing out here to the Romans that the real issue of access to God, the real issue of access to God has to do with being forgiven, being justified by faith. God justifies us on the basis of our faith in Him and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ apart from the works of the law. There's nothing you can do to justify yourself. but we are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> in verse 29, is, is He the God of the Jews only? Is He not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So there's no discussion of doing away with the law of God. That's not what Paul is talking about at all. What Paul is talking about is gaining access to God, being justified before God, having our sins blotted out, having our guilt removed. You know, the scorner denies that he has any guilt. The individual who's overwhelmed with worldly sorrow denies that the sacrifice of Christ is big enough to take care of his guilt. Maybe hadn't thought of it quite that way, but that's really what it is. It is a lack of faith in Jesus Christ and His sacrifice, which we're told... Uh, we just got through seeing in Acts uh, in Acts 13 that it is able to be justified. Those that are be believe are able to be justified from all things. The individual who's overwhelmed with worldly sorrow is really unwilling and unable to accept and to believe that the sacrifice of Christ is big enough 
to take care of the whole problem. You know, if we could save ourselves, why did Jesus Christ have to come and die? And if He did, as He did, then we are told that we have a response that we need to make. A response to God's gift. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, 6, referring to God who has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. The letter kills, the Spirit gives life. If the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now, you remember the story when Moses went up into the mountain to get the tables of stone, to get uh, the Ten Commandments. When he came back down the mountain, he had been in the presence of God for 40 days and were told that his face glowed. He had actually absorbed, uh, as it were, uh, a certain amount of of the, the emanating power and glory that emanated out from God. And when he came down, his face shined and there was a glory that that uh, exuded out from him that was so overwhelming and intimidating to the children of Israel that they could not stand to look on his face. And so uh, a veil was put over his face when he spoke to them. Uh, a veil was put over his face so that they could not see the glow. And over a period of time, the glow faded back to his normal skin tone, his normal countenance. Now, Paul quotes that. Uh, That account, of course, is given uh, back in Exodus 24. uh, uh, And uh, the... uh, But... When he... uh, uh, came on down here that it was a temporary. That was, that was glory, but it was temporary. And Paul makes the point that if the, that that was temporary, just as the covenant that it was a reflection of was also temporary. It was the administration of death. It was a covenant that was made with a physical nation. It was based on the same law of God, based on the Ten Commandments. But it was based on the physical application of those commandments to a civil nation. It was based on the application through civil statutes to a physical nation that would enter into a special relationship with God. That was a temporary situation because The covenant that is permanent is the new covenant, which is the covenant that God is in the process of making with us, of writing His laws in our hearts and in our minds. But it comes on down that, verse 11, if that which is done away was glorious, how much more is that which remains glorious? Seeing then we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel uh, could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished, because what Moses did was something that uh, uh, was temporary. But their minds were blinded until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ just as they couldn't look on Moses because the, there was a veil that, that uh, veiled Moses' face, so in the same way their minds also were veiled to the spiritual insight of the Old Testament, really understanding the real message of the Messiah and what it was all about. And he said, uh, verse 15, even unto this day when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. They, they just don't get it. Nevertheless, when it shall take 
shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. The Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Therefore, seeing as we have this ministry, we've received mercy, we think not, we've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, whom the God of this world has blinded their minds. Minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So he says, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. God, who commands the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give light of the knowledge of the glory of the Father in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. This power, this strength of God's Spirit, you know, right now it's in earthen vessels. It's in God working through human instruments. Weak, fallible human beings, just like you and me. The excellency of the power, the real credit, the real glory goes to Him, not to us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in our, in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be made manifest in our body. We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So, he's saying, that as we go through our lives, yes, there are difficulties, yes, there are adversities, yes, there are things that bear us down, uh, yes, there are problems, but there is a source of help through those. Verse 14, Knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things which are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal. They're temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. So, we have, we're told on down in chapter 5 and verse 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are of God who has reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Down in verse 21, has made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. We then as workers together with Him beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. She received not the grace of God in vain. God offers to us His grace. He offers to us His mercy. He offers to us the way out from under guilt. He offers the way to be transformed in a renewing of our mind. He offers to us the solution. But we have to be prepared to reach out and embrace that solution, to accept that solution, to believe that solution. The solution is not to scorn at guilt. It's not to be overwhelmed with guilt in the sense of worldly guilt, worldly sorrow. But it is the approach of real, godly repentance an acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which produces a sense of confidence. 
You know, God doesn't want us to go around with this sort of a, a sense of impending doom hanging over our heads. That's not the attitude of, of, of a forgiven Christian. A confident in God. You see, the problem in, in, uh, uh, the problem with the one who is overwhelmed with worldly sorrow is that individual lacks confidence in God. He lacks confidence in, in God and God's power and God's strength. He lacks confidence in, in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and in the power of God and in the veracity of God to do what He said. God holds out the way to us to have that confidence and that faith. Not a self-confidence, not a confidence that rests in how great we are and how powerful we are, but a confidence that rests in the power of God to realize that, yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear any evil. Why? Because we're walking with God. We're walking with God. In the 51st Psalm, David's Psalm of Repentance, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. He said in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which you've broken may rejoice. Hide not your face, or hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with your free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted unto you. So, David understood the way out from under guilt was to go to God, to confess it, to beseech God for His intervention, His mercy, His forgiveness, His spiritual cleansing. But when we go to God and we lay claim on that, we need to have the confidence that God will do what He says He will do. God makes promises in His Word. And we can have confidence and faith based on those promises. We don't have to go through life denying and scorning guilt. That sort of an attitude is very destructive and is going to bring the judgment of God. You know, the scorner is going to come up against uh, God's judgment and is going to be confronted with reality. But you know, just as destructive is the attitude of those who are overwhelmed with worldly sorrow. A sense of, of, of futility, a sense of, purposeless, of purposelessness, a sense of just being overwhelmed with guilt and with despair at what they've done. The solution is to go to God. You know, we're told sin, of course, isolates us, it cuts us off from God. It inhibits our fellowship with God because God dwells in righteousness. God dwells in the light. We have to come to the light and walk in the light. We're told in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, that's a promise. We really go to God and we admit it, we face it, we acknowledge it. He's faithful. He's just to forgive us, to cleanse us. Coming on down in chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sin, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that says, I know Him and keeps not His commandments is a liar and truth not any. Whoso keeps His word in Him truly is the love of God perfected. You know, to claim that we are, uh, we know God and that we're walking with God and not to be keeping God's commandments and obeying God's law uh, is uh, contradictory. But John goes on to say, as we come on back toward the latter part of the book here in 1 John chapter 4. In verse 16, we have known and believed the love that God has to us. God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we might have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, so are we in this world. You know what that means? We might have boldness in the day of judgment. The word judgment here in the Greek language is the word crisis. That day of God's judgment, the day of the Lord, the day of the crisis at the close of the age, that we can have boldness in that day. We can have boldness in that day. <clears throat> How can you have boldness and confidence in the events that are ahead of us, the events of the tribulation and the day of the Lord? How can there be boldness and confidence? Well, what we're told right here we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, so are we in this world. As He is. In other words, we in this world right now, in this age, are letting Jesus Christ live His life in us. As He is, so are we in this world. That right now, today, we're living. Allowing Jesus Christ to live His life in us. Recognizing that the power of God and the mercy of God is capable of blotting out and forgiving our sins. Having the confidence to accept that, realizing God justifies His elect. As we look to Him. But then we are told that we're to receive not the grace of God in vain. That we are to go forward with our Christian life. That we're to allow Jesus Christ to live in us. That we're to yield our body as an instrument to Him. That means that we've got to draw close to God in prayer, and in Bible study, and in fasting. Yielding ourselves, seeking with the power of God to beat down the human nature, the vanity, the jealousy, the lust, the greed, the attitudes that are intrinsic to us. Because while worldly sorrow may have regret about what we've done, real godly sorrow goes way, way beyond that. It is a matter of recognizing what we are. Judas was overwhelmed with remorse for what he had done because things didn't work out somehow as he maybe had, whatever he had had in mind. He was depressed and overwhelmed with that sense of guilt. 
and it destroyed him. That's not what God wants in our behalf. He has made possible not our destruction, but our salvation. He has made possible the taking of us and the making of us into something far, far different than what we are or what we could ever make and tra- make ourselves to be. God's power is a transforming power. God's mercy and God's forgiveness is there to make possible our reconciliation to God, to bring us into a harmonious relationship with God. Justify standing before God. No longer encumbered with the weight of sin. But God has given us His Spirit to enable us to go forward from that point. We are to dwell in love. The love of God that shed abroad in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. The love of God that is the fulfilling of His law. Because verse 3 of chapter 5, 1 John here, where we're reading, it says, this is the love of God that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. He that dwells in love dwells in God and God in Him. And herein is our love made perfect, made complete. It is, it is made complete that we might have boldness in the day of judgment because as He is, Jesus Christ as He is right now, so are we in this world because Jesus Christ is living His life in us. There's no fear in that love. There's a confidence that comes, the confidence in God because we're living our lives in the fear of God and the reverence of God filled with awe and reverence for the greatness and the power of God. It's not what you and I can make out of ourselves, brethren. It's what God can take out, can take us and do with us. But we have to trust Him to do it. Can we believe that God will really do what He says? That He can take us and make us and shape us and transform us. Instead of simply being overwhelmed with a sense of guilt because of what we've done, real godly sorrow involves seeing what we are. That we have a nature that personifies vanity, jealousy, lust, and greed but that God can transform and change that nature, can put a new nature, a new heart within us, can write His laws in our hearts and in our minds. That's what conversion is all about. The matter of turning from our ways to God's way, allowing God to transform through His power, through His Spirit. There is a confidence and a boldness that we can have. Not the, con- not the false confidence and false boldness of the scorner whose confidence is in himself. Not the pseudo-humility of the one who's overwhelmed with worldly sorrow who lacks confidence You see, what they both have in common is neither one has confidence in God. The scorner nor the one who's overwhelmed with worldly sorrow, neither has confidence in God. And that is the only source of real confidence. Because God's power is the only power that will never fail you. It will never let you down. It will never fail in a pinch. That's the power that can transform you and me and can enable us to ultimately not only be transformed and renewed spiritually in this life, but that will ultimately make possible our entrance into the kingdom of God at the resurrection. When this mortal will put on immortality, 
This corruption will put on incorruption. When in a moment of the twinkling of an eye, the last trump shall sound, and our mortal body will be transformed into the glorious spirit body like God. That we will be like Him and we will see Him as He is. God's mercy, God's forgiveness, God's justification and reconciliation makes it possible. Never ever take it for granted or take it lightly. It is a precious gift. Both for now and forever.